Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Good. So I wrote these slides yesterday, and I, I may have been a little bit hungover, so if I'm unfamiliar, that'll explain why. So what, what, what DNSSEC, what is DNSSEC? Now there were a fair number of hands up before, so some people know something about it. Um, so this is not a slide deck about DNSSEC, the protocol. It's not a tutorial. There is a tutorial on Wednesday. Um, but the topic here is a little bit different. This is about deployment. But we have to know something about what this is. So for those who didn't put a hand up before, there's a few RFCs that you can read the next time you're you know, bored on the toilet. Um, the whole system basically is a system of putting keys and signatures in the DNS. And by in the DNS, I mean in the zone. So you sign stuff in the zone, and the resulting signatures also go in the zone. You sign them with keys, the public portions of which are stored in the zone. So non-secured DNS is a system of zone files. The data is zone files. And we have delegations between zones, and we end up with a great big global namespace. With DNSSEC, it's exactly the same principle, except the zones within themselves are signed. They contain some cryptographic nonsense that tells you, gives you the ability to be able to tell whether an answer you got is reasonable. So this is, again, public key cryptography. Um, it's a keep your private keys private, you publish your public keys, you use a private key for signing, you use a public key for verifying a signature. So if you use PGP, this is familiar. This is public key cryptography. It's not rocket science. So the important thing with DNSSEC is there's no encryption here. There's no transport security. There's no, nothing, no encrypted channel between a, a user and his cache, or between a cache and an authority server. Um, there's no privacy measures. Anybody who's snooping the wire can find out with DNSSEC exactly the same stuff that they can find out without DNSSEC. So all DNSSEC is giving you is a way to verify the authenticity of the answers you receive. Um, so here's the obligatory diagram which shows that in, in, a, in more than one color. So on the left here, top left, we have a parent zone. Bottom right, we have a child zone. And anybody who's configured a, a zone in the DNS has set up a domain name somewhere and, and edited the zone file themselves. There's really no difference here. The only difference is that the delegation, if you go all the way, is a, is a secure delegation. Because as well as the NS records that you use to point to the name servers in a child zone, you also have a DS record, a delegation signer, which in effect is a hash of the public key that's used in the child. So if you have some trust in the parent zone, you can infer some trust in the child zone. And that's how the whole thing gets itself together. You don't need to know the keys of every zone in the DNS. Ideally, you just need to know one, one key. And you can work everything out as you go along. So it's designed to be incremental. <coughs> so here's the, the panacea. Um, it's not quite a panacea right now. There's 300 odd TLDs. I've only put three on the, on the slide here. But as a client who's receiving data from the DNS, ideally you want one thing that you have to trust, as I mentioned. So you have a trust anchor, and you have a trust anchor for the root zone. The root zone is signed, all those delegations to org, com, net, CA in the future, all kinds of other TLDs are also signed. ISOC.org is the example here, which is signed. You can, if, you, if you check it out, you can validate answers from that zone. Um, so in this example, we, learn, we, we could configure one thing, which is the brown box, and everything else we learn on the fly which means all the stuff is dynamic. There's a minimal amount of configuration in end-user machines and in ISP caches that ever needs to be changed. So all this stuff is very positive. This is all talking about how easy this should be to deploy. So the question, I suppose, is why aren't people doing it? <coughs> so what needs to happen to deploy this stuff? Well, it depends slightly on who you are and what you do in the DNS. So zone managers, and by zone managers, I really mean the people who maintain the data in a zone, whether it's using BI in a shell or whether it's using a web page or whatever. Zone managers, if they want to accelerate deployment of DNSSEC, they sign the zones, and they take the public key portion, and they publish that trust anchor in their parent zone. So if you have your domain as isoft.org or ican.org, then you host your zone in the same way as normal. You throw an extra switch to say, sign this zone, and then the small amount of information that drops out of the key generation process, the DS, RR set, you send that to your parent, and you do that through a registrar, same way as you do with NS records. And if you're the kind of zone that has different users um, underneath you, if you have your own child zones, like you run a CCTLD uh, zone or something like that, then you also provide a mechanism for people to send their trust anchors to you. So really, that's the amount of work that needs to be done as far as deployment goes for the zone managers. So for cache operators, so 
quick show of hands. Who, who in the room would class themselves as either one of these? Either a zone manager or a cash operator. So put down your hand if you're a zone manager. Leave it up if you're a cash operator. Okay. <coughs> so there's a few. So the question for cash operators is what do we have to do? I mean, with IPv6, we know the ISP plays a crucial role in connecting to some backbone ish concept and providing access to their customers. And the ISP's participation in this is quite crucial. In DNSSEC, what does an ISP have to do? Well, the ISP, at a minimum, can do nothing at all, apart from just not being evil. So ISPs that deliberately mess with results from the cache, they synthesize NX domains, they provide redirects to other places and things, that's all going to break DNSSEC. That's not going to work. People who um, block access to port 53 off their network and insist that everybody uses their own ad-generating DNS service, that's all evil. That's not going to help DNSSEC deployment at all. But apart from that, even if you don't turn on validation in your cache, even if your own cache doesn't care about the authenticity of data and just stores whatever it receives, end users can still use DNSSEC. So if you've not already been evil and you have no plans to start, and even if you have no plans to turn on validation, you're not holding up DNSSEC deployment. So this is a nice easy thing as well. Again, the deployment seems simple for this stuff. <coughs> so how do you sign a zone? Um, well, we're going to talk about how, the, how to sign a zone that is material for the tutorial, but how far have we got with signing zones? So we signed the root zone in uh, 2011. This was ICANN, US Department of Commerce, and Verisign working together. Um, July 15th, I think, 2000, no, it wasn't 2000, it was 2010, it was previous year. I've dropped a year somehow. That happens. Um, many TLDs since then have, have become signed. Some were signed before the root was signed. But really, the big uptick we've seen is since the root has been signed. So there's a bunch of them now. All the big GTLDs are signed, growing number of CCTLDs. And for people who are interested in the, in the number space, um, ARPA has been signed for quite a long time. In ARPA, IP6.ARPA, they're all signed. And mechanisms exist for the RARs to be able to push these secure delegations in there. So the reverse DNS is more or less ready today. You can pretty much get the entire reverse DNS done as long as people sign their zones. Uh, but what we have seen is even in regions where there has been um, a great deal of enthusiasm about DNSSEC and the TLD has been signed, still people that registrants, the people who actually register domains under those TLDs, still very few of them typically have signed anything. Uh, even those that have signed, they do it in a test bed, they don't necessarily publish their trust anchors. The Czech guys um, who, are, who do a lot of outreach um, in and around Prague for CZ, they actually, actually worked out who the big domain hosting customers were and went out and did proactive outreach towards them and tried to convince a lot of these people to sign their zones that they were hosting for other customers. And by attacking those people first, attacking, helping those people first, <laughs> they ended up with quite a remarkable sort of deployment of DNSSEC under CZ. So it, it can happen, but it's not happening as we see it in general. <coughs> so here's the graph. This is a fairly typical deployment graph. This is our DS, DS, DS records in the root zone. So the bottom left is when the root zone was signed. Um, there were a few waiting to go at that point for some TLDs that had signed early, like org. Um, you see a, so a few step functions where some companies who are responsible for a bunch of TLDs will do them all together. So you see these little vertical, vertical lines. And you see this sort of curve, which looks like it's, it's sort of flattening out, but it's not becoming really flat. Things are still happening. It's just that the first wave of people who are really enthusiastic about this have kind of done their work now, and there's another wave happening of people who are taking longer, perhaps learning from the experiences of the others. <coughs> Here's an obligatory map of the world. See, CA has an enormous role to play here because there could be a big section of that green that was map that was green. <laughs> and Russia's about to go green, so it's going to be unbalanced if we don't do something. <laughs> Again, without dropping directly into the tutorial, um, if you're running Bind, any vaguely recent version of Bind, and really if it's an old version of Bind, you've already been hacked and lost control of your name server anyway. <laughs> so if it's a modern version of Bind, this stuff already does. The signing tools are built in, DNSSEC is turned on by default, um, validation is not on by default, but again, that's, a, you know, that's an option that you have to do or not to do. Um, Open DNSSEC, if anybody's heard of it is a really a package specifically designed for signing lots of zones and also dealing with hardware security modules, HSMs, um, which also a lot of TLDs are using. PowerDNS, apparently, which is a favorite of web hosters and uh, domainers all around the world. Database backend, lots and lots of zones added with minimal hassle and things. They've recently declared their DNSSEC implementation production ready, and they're using it. So the tools all seem to be there. 
How do you serve? Sign zone, same way as you serve an unsigned zone, pretty much. There's no change there. Um, and here, I, I mentioned this before, cache operators, uh, you can turn on validation, but bear in mind that if you do turn on validation, which seems like the right thing to do, there's going to be a cost to it. Because signing your zones is not an exact science. Um, people make mistakes. TLDs have made mistakes. And there have been periods of time where, because the DNS is cached and new data doesn't propagate instantly, whole TLDs have gone off the network for eight hours if you validate. And that has happened. And if you're an ISP with uh, 50,000 customers, then that's going to make the help desk phone ring. That's going to cost you money. So there are some things to be aware of with validation. You need to keep sort of the ear to the ground and have your channels available so you know what's going on if something like that happens. I mean, the last time something like that happened was, was a while ago now, but you know, mistakes do happen. We expect more mistakes to happen in the future. But like I said, even if you don't turn on validation, as long as you're not being evil, then everything should be good anyway. So if it's up to the end user to validate, how do you do it? Well, if you're using Chrome, then my understanding is you're already doing it. You just don't realize you're doing it. If, uh, recent Chrome, anyway. If you're using Firefox and you happen to install uh, one, one or more of the DNSSEC validator modules, then you're already doing it. Um, there's a, a little package that was released two weeks ago in, in the right meeting in Vienna called DNSSEC Trigger by Analnet Labs, and what that does, it installs a local copy of a resolver on your machine that runs on Windows, Mac, other things. Um, it basically does validation behind the scenes <coughs> directly there. It has a nice little sort of control on the dash, on the menu bar and things on the Mac and on the Windows. And, uh, and that all seems to work as well. So the validation can all happen on the user machine. It doesn't have to happen anywhere else. So here's the big question I suppose needs to be answered. If, if it's all so easy to deploy, and yet it's not really being deployed that much, then, then why should we do it? Well, the traditional answer to this, the usual answer is that there's a lot of cache poisoning going on. The DNS is not a secure protocol, as originally specified and as used without DNSSEC. Um, the cache can be full of all kinds of crap. And sometimes it's just harmless crap, and sometimes it's malicious crap. And really, whatever kind of crap it is, you don't really want to. Um, the trouble is, it's not always easy to tell. If you were trying to look up some statistics on the cache and say, well, what proportion of this cache is actually invalid data? If you don't have signatures and things, you can't really tell. And if people haven't signed their zones, you don't have signatures. So really, signing the zones is the thing that needs to come first for this stuff to be really useful. But I think the, the larger point is, you know, in talking about a platform for innovation, what we're building here is we're building a public key infrastructure that sits on top of something that everybody already has and needs to use. Everybody uses the DNS. It's global. All the different difficulties about the international aspect of it, about all these other kinds of things, they're all being taken care of for other reasons. And what we're left with is a giant naming scheme, beautifully distributed across a billion name servers, which works today. And it's sitting there, and it could be a PKI. And every other attempt, really, to make a global PKI that isn't completely filled, riddled with security holes, or um, gaps in, in, in a web of trust, and all these kinds of things, have largely all failed, and nobody can really rely on them day to day. But the DNS already exists, and it's already here. And by signing zones, we get the opportunity to serve secure signed data towards anybody in the world who can use the DNS, which is pretty much everybody who uses the internet. So this is the opportunity. <coughs> so there's some examples at the bottom here. Um, opportunistic TLS, which happens between SMTP servers. Uh, the, the certificates you use for securing IMAP and SMTP for submission and for reading mail. These, these are early days, so perhaps these seem like trivial examples, but I mean, they, there are examples that exist. Um, HTTP. Routing security, potentially. Um, RPKI has a different model for sharing keys and things like that, but you know, more PKIs are good. Um, SSH key management, people who SSH into machines, you can put a certificate, a fingerprint for, your, uh, for, your, for the key on your server in the DNS. If it's signed with DNSSEC, then the recent open DNSSEC will, will look that up and will decide to trust it. You won't get the warning messages about keys being changed. So you can publish all this stuff and take a lot of the vagary, the whole click OK business, out of, the, uh, out of the whole business of, of doing secure transport. <coughs> and this last, last little bit here, because I realize I'm wishing on. Um, so this is one particular application of DNSSEC, which has seen a remarkable amount of progress in the IETF in a fairly short time. It's got a stupid name, because it's the IETF, but it's Dane. So the idea of this is people have observed that there are, there are some challenges in the way that SSL certificates are managed today. SSL certificates are routinely issued on the basis of bits of Photoshop letterhead and, you know, pretend disguised accents on telephones. 
Um, CAs go bad sometimes. CAs don't have proper practices. They don't lose their keys. The browser list of trust anchors is now nearing, I think, 200 different root certificates. And you've got to think within 200 root certificates, there's a couple. You can't have personal knowledge in, in the practices of all those to have any real confidence in that browser list being accurate. You trust your supplier. So the alternative that Dane is, is promising is take, generate your own certificate, manage it according to how you want it to be managed, with your own rollover life cycles, your own key sizes, everything else. And instead of relying on a CA to sign it to say it's authentic, publish it in the DNS and assign a zone. And that way, anybody who looks up your name in order to reach a mail server or a, or a web server or whatever can find the certificate there. It can do its own comparison between the secure data from the DNS and whatever was presented in the TLS exchange. And it can authenticate without any CAs. So there's no cost here. The inconvenience of having to remember how to deal with a CA or remember an anniversary date for billing. The difficulty of getting a, a $15 invoice pushed through accounts payable and actually paid ever. You know, all these things go away. And you end up in control of your own secure key security and your own distribution of keys. And the one thing that came up recently, or multiple times recently, when you have a problem right now with a failed CA, you're waiting for a browser update to send out a new set of a new browser list with a new list of trusted CAs that emits the one that's bad. Until that goes out, until users upgrade, you've got no ability to stop people trusting the old key, which is now compromised. With Dane, you can publish it as fast as you can change a www in his own file. So you can actually push out key revocation straight away, you can push out new keys straight away. So there's a lot of interest in this because this seems like a good way of providing a decent PKI for an established cryptographic scheme, which is what we have in X509. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of key opportunity, but no doubt the message is that there will be more because having a PKI that works is useful. So here's your homework. First of all, you have to sign some zones. That's the most important thing. Even if your parent's not signed, at least play with the tools and, and figure out if you're the kind of person who, you know, edits zone files. Find out how you do it and play with it. Um, make sure your caches are nice and clean and pass through DNSSEC records correctly. So do some digs against your own cache and make sure that if you put the plus DNSSEC little option at the end of it, that you get back signatures for things that you know should be signed. Turn on validation, like I say, if you feel like it. And if you don't, if you think it's too expensive, then don't. That's fine, too. Um, and try out some of the client software. And I don't think anybody these days is in the business of sending out a CD to a customer with, you know, Eudora on it or something. Um, <laughs> latest version of Netscape Navigator. But, um, you know, people, where, where you do have information to give to customers and things like that, perhaps at some point it's reasonable to say, mention this stuff. If you want secure use of the DNS, which we support as an ISP because we're advanced, because um, we did nothing and we just decided not to be evil. Um, then encourage people to, to install it and try it out. And that's it.